So I'm, I'm really, really happy to be here, really, really excited. And I'm going to try to move fast. I'll be happy to take questions afterwards. Um, I am a um, mathematician by training, software engineer by trade. And I'm going to start the talk by conducting a taboo in Silicon Valley. I'm actually old. Like, like really, really old. Like, I, I could do 45 minutes of I'm so old jokes. But I learned Fortran on cards. And the young people in the audience are going, is Fortran good for poker? <laughs> so I began my career building high performance image and signal processing systems using parallel processing, go fast, hardware accelerators. And eventually I always wound up maintaining a pseudo Unix kernel. Right. Um, I also, at the same time, I was teaching part-time in the Santa Clara Graduate School of Engineering. Um, I taught uh, applied math for literally decades. And then eventually, I had the latitude to begin to create software classes. The first class I ever invented was called Time-Driven Software Management. I picked out a textbook from a guy named Jim Highsmith. And uh, several years later, Jim Highsmith was a signatory to the Agile Manifesto. So I was teaching Agile before Agile was Agile. And I, a quarter century ago, I was a customer for stuff like PSOCs and QNX. And I actually worked in the kernel group at Linksos, and, um, which is the Millennium Falcon of real-time Unix. And just a quirk of history, Linksos is not a Linux derivative. It actually was a ground up, completely independent, real-time Unix code base. Uh, remarkable technical achievement and a really bad investment. Um, which brings me to Netscaler and FreeBSD. Now, um, on the Netscaler, if you pick up my uh, LinkedIn profile, you can see there's a lot of information there about the Netscaler nation. Uh, I don't want to make this about the Netscaler product. It's really about our FreeBSD journey. Um, but I am here as an ambassador from the Netscaler nation to thank the FreeBSD community. You made our product possible. We've been in the market for 25 years. That's only because of FreeBSD. There are some other critical decisions that were made, but um, we, are, um, we, we stand on the foundation that you built, and I'm just here to share a little bit about that journey. Now, um, I, I came to Netscaler just after the Linux bubble popped, and I found a pile of 50 network engineers, and uh, there was basically no uh, Unix kernel experience on that team. Um, I was actually hired as a software manager, which is why my agile experience is relevant. Um, but I immediately found out that uh, what was really needed there was Unix kernel expertise, and I took that over, and I've been managing the FreeBSD baseline inside of Netscaler ever since. And um, I do a whole bunch of other stuff, and I tried to explain everything I do. You wouldn't believe me, so I'll just move on. Um, so um, <clears throat> what, what we had at that time was we had and I maybe admit to software management, but I don't really do slides. Um, so <clears throat> So we had an architecture that is pretty much a template for networking equipment in the industry. And it's basically that there's a management plane and the data plane. But the radical element of the Netscaler was that the um, data plane is software and has always been software. And uh, with a very small amount of um, hardware acceleration. And the management plane uh, was in user mode, and the data plane uh, was in the kernel. And this was running on top of FreeBSD 2.2.5. So that's where the Netscaler journey starts, is on FreeBSD 2.2.5. And the reason that the people who were there before me chose that was specifically for intellectual property reasons. Netscaler, from its founding, has taken open source intellectual property extremely seriously. And 
they worked on FreeBSD because they wanted to do a kernel data plane and they wanted to protect the code. Now, what that data plane looked like was it, they took the OSI 7 layer network model and compressed it into one small hard ball of C code. So we have a packet scribbler running in the kernel. That's our data plane. And this is the original founding of the Netscaler product. Now, when I come into the picture, and again, I've been working pseudo Unix kernels, real time embedded kernels, no experience with FreeBSD before they hired me. So, is that enough for people to recognize that? This is a 32-bit process, right? And the first thing I noticed about FreeBSD is that page zero is always unmapped. And I thought, so cool. That's so cool. I know so much, you know, so many bugs over the years where basically page zero was being used as a scratch pad, right? Um, and uh, so I started to fall in love with FreeBSD. And the first problem that I solved was when you have um, the data plane running in the kernel, small hard ball of C code, um, basically this portion of the memory map dictated your capacity. And so what I did is I took the stack and moved it down by a gig. It's like, wow, doubled the capacity of the system. and. Uh, that's part of how I earned the credibility to keep doing this 25 layers later. And then eventually, we st stuck it down another gig and um, thereby expanded the capacity of the system. So <clears throat> the next thing that happens is the guy who hired me comes to me and he goes, we've got to do MP. We're living in a single processor world. The future is MP. We can't do this this way. And I looked at him and I said, you've got to upgrade the operating system. So what did we do? We began the transition from we went from FreeBSD 2.2.5 to FreeBSD 4.4. And that upgrade I did. Um, <clears throat> And uh, we were heading into the dot-com crash. And the startup people bet the company on that release. And we made it. We survived for multiple reasons specific to the Netscaler product. And that information is available through the uh, LinkedIn profile. Just look for hashtag Netscaler Nation. So we went from doubling our memory capacity to now we could double our compute power. So this is how we chose to do that. Because there's, um, again, it's just a small hard ball of C code. running in the kernel, and now we've got two processors, and now we're running both of them in the kernel. So what did we do? We have our management plane running in more or less a semi-normal FreeBSD type environment, FreeBSD 4.4. We have our data plane running in the kernel, and then on the second processor, we ran an affinity stub, dropped into the kernel, and had a compression engine sitting there offloading the compute power so that we could do a better job of surfacing the NICs with the data plane. So the fundamental concept here was we turn off the interrupts and outrun the NIC. And this is how we did our software data plane. 
and we were able to outrun the NIC for 25 years. So, in this context, <clears throat> another thing that we did was, um, you know, due to some business reasons, there was an expansion of functionality. We picked up this other company that had a um, layer 7 firewall product, and we wanted to incorporate it. So we migrated the layer 7 firewall into this in-kernel implementation that was running inside the kernel in the coprocessor. And, and this, this layer 7 firewall was implemented in uthreads. I don't know if people remember uthreads or not, but this was, uh, you know, set jump, long jump, and, um, you know, I think um, Mr. Tolvald's distinguished opinion of threads is too extreme. I think you guys got it right. Um, threads work best when the threads are uh, scheduler visible as a debugging environment, but we actually made this work and productized it and put it out into the field. So, and at this time, you know, the Netscaler, what is it? It's running a load balancer, it's doing compression, it's doing SSL, and um, acting as a load balancer. One of the things we were able to offer their customers was um, there was a time about the time of the crash and the early part of uh, a couple of decades ago, about 20 years ago, there was a time when your costs were related to the certificates that you had to pay by the certificate per server. We were able to pull the certificates off the servers and put them onto the load balancer and get a reduction in scale in their costs. And that was one of the cost benefit trade-offs that caused the product to survive. So, and we had a lot of really big name customers in the um, new economy. Um, many, many war stories. But the scale of the MP world continued to expand. And obviously, this particular architecture with the two processors was not viable. So what we were driving towards eventually looked more like this. And the basic concept is, um, you know, we have a management plane still in user mode, more or less vanilla FreeBSD for the most part. Um, we have normal kernel services here, and we affinitize the rest of the processors um, <clears throat> and uh, have a driver support on the kernel side but these are basically packet engines in user mode, you know, created a zero copy implementation to access the data. And um, this architecture first began working on FreeBSD 4.9 in prototype form. And in between the 4.4 release and the 4.9 release, um, I was away for the company for a period of time. I'm a Netscaler boomerang. Netscaler Nation boomerangs are one of our properties is because, you know, people work in Netscaler, they go somewhere else, and they come back because everything else is worse. Um, and we have a lot of fun. And, of course, you know, you can tell by the outlines of my career that I'm a very typical engineer. Other people got rich and I had fun, right? Um, <clears throat> so they did this upgrade from FreeBSD 4.4 to 4.9 by themselves without my involvement. And... Um, it's a very typical, um, it's a warning to the young people, okay? Because um, they also took on some very ambitious packaging changes. And the ambitious packaging changes were to create a memory file system and to have the root file system linked into the kernel as a memory file system. So you boot and you come up and you're booting against an object that's linked into your kernel. Right, as a root file system, then we make it writable and stuff, and that's where temp lives, and then there's other stuff on the file system. And of course, the reason that what was done is makes perfect sense, right? It's because it, when you have a kernel and you have stuff living on a media device, 
over time, there's a tendency for those two things to get incoherent with each other. And the user mode actually is important for making sure the kernel's working. So the fact that it's linked into the kernel gives you product consistency. So the goal was great, but the problem was that because they ambitiously took on this packaging change along with the OS upgrade at the same time, the build didn't work for a year, right? So I came back to the product on the other side of this transition, and everybody's walking around with PTSD. It's like, we can never upgrade the operating system again. Never, ever, we can never upgrade it again. And I'm like, I'm back, right? It's okay, <laughs> right? <clears throat> So um, I looked at this, at the architecture, and they were starting to spin this thing up on FreeBSD 4.9, and I said, guess what? You need to upgrade the operating system again. So what did I do? I came in and I explained, you know, there's this thing out there called the big giant lock, and, you know, they're wandering through the 5.x series, and it's going to be okay, and, uh, but we have to upgrade, right? And the place I chose to land was um, FreeBSD 6.3, okay? And, um, and the, the architect who was driving this guy, you know, he's, you know, bought into this um, PTSD mindset with everybody else, and um, he goes, how do you know it's going to work? I said, we'll make it work. It's okay. So what did we do? We, we migrated forward to FreeBSD 6.3, and, and by the way, um, just another trivia point. So, um, it was three days, right? That's my standard. Jonah and the whale, three days. I had a clean build in test, running Sanity, run on top of FreeBSD 4.9 on Friday, and the following Tuesday, I had a clean build on FreeBSD 6.3 running in Sanity, right? Three days, the build is dark, right? Not a year. And so all the PTSD dissipates. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and, and what did we do in that context? Um, in FreeBSD 6.3, um, you know, all of our NIC drivers have always been custom and proprietary to us, right? We have a reference driver out there. It basically is, um, it's important, but it's, it doesn't get us where we need to be. Um, <clears throat> so um, we hacked the scheduler to do the affinity. Um, we hacked in NUMA support because our high-end systems have always been two socket. Um, we, um, <clears throat> Uh, somebody had the bright idea that we should we should do RAID, you know, to make our systems look more reliable, and um, so we chose LSI. God bless them, you know. Uh, no complaints about those people, but we were running on FreeBSD 6.3, and they said um, uh, we support FreeBSD 8. Come back when you're ready, and and so um, that was not an option at that time. One of the last drivers that I worked on in my career is I backported MS, Mr. SAS. Our friend, Mr. Sass, the driver, I backported to 6.3 by myself. Um, there was another guy trying to backport a different driver. I won the race, so mine went in the code. And all of their tools didn't work. And we actually fielded a product using the LSI controller um, uh, based on their technology with none of their tool support whatsoever. And, um, uh, <coughs> and, then, and then later, we got wise after that experience, and we switched over to um, FreeBSD software RAID, and I'll, I'll get to that as well. Um, but um, this product actually was successful. We succeeded on this transition. We basically archived the um, in-kernel um, packet engine that had previously existed, and, um, and, and again, just as a Silicon Valley story, the bone, the valley, this valley, the, the bones of companies litter this valley, okay, with companies that needed to go from a single processor uh, solution to a multiprocessor solution, knew what they had to do and didn't make it, right? And we did. And so this is like about 15 years ago. We're still alive. We're continuing to innovate. We're making this happen, running on top of FreeBSD 6.3. And then... Um, <clears throat> We come along and our next stop on the journey was FreeBSD 8.4. Um, <clears throat> so in the context of FreeBSD.4, um, uh, 
we switched, uh, we, we unwound our scheduler hack. We had a strategic goal. Our strategic goal was to not fall in love with our own code and to use what the community was bringing us. And so we switched over to scheduler pools and got rid of our infinity, um, affinity um, uh, intrusions, what we call intrusions. Um, we um, uh, switched over to uh, the software RAID in this, uh, in this time frame in the 8.4 context. And um, in retrospect, with a decade of experience, uh, FreeBSD's software RAID implementation um, was more reliable than using a hardware RAID product. Um, we were able to make both of them work to industry standards, but um, uh, FreeBSD uh, deserves tremendous credit for the quality of that implementation. And in fact, the FreeBSD file system support has always been excellent. We've never had to do anything in there, um, you know, aside from making our, um, uh, <coughs> um, making our uh, memory file system, root file system work. Um, so, um, in the context of FreeBSD 8 default 4, we also start the process of migrating our product from 32-bit to 64-bit, uh, right? So we're transitioning during this window from x86 to AMD 64, and um, we started that process by building a cross-compiler. Um, so we were actually cross-compiling uh, for the x86 target in the um, in an uh, AMD 64 server environment in the FreeBSD 8.4 context. I had a friend who was a uh, GCC expert and was with us for a time and built that cross compiler. Our build, when we went to the, um, uh, the root file system, uh, the memory file system, the build was actually stolen from the FreeBSD build, right? The full OS build, we stole that for our build process and we hacked everything in because we wanted everything. My goal was you always compile everything from sources. Right? And you do that because um, we don't want to delay learning. When you delay learning, learning is more expensive. Right? And if you build for everything from sources every time, then you learn things faster. Right? So um, again, building off of FreeBSD technology to support our product. Um, I also, at this time, I'm in Dev IPMI customizing. And boy, if you want me to show up and give you a three hour rant on uh, biggest industry mistakes in my career, um, IPMI and uh, BMC and LOM, holy smokes. Um, <clears throat> again, a distraction, don't want to get sucked in. Um, <clears throat> so um, we finished the transition to 64-bit. Um, uh, you know, we start with a cross-compile environment, then we stuck a 64-bit uh, kernel down here underneath a series of 32 packet engines, 32-bit packet engines. So these guys are still living in a, a four gig process space. And um, <clears throat> we, um, then we flipped the tool chain around. So um, instead of using uh, the 32-bit target, we switched over to using a, uh, you know, the dash M compile option and basically building 32-bit processes in, uh, in the context of a, um, uh, uh, AMD 64 toolchain, and um, we, we completed that transition, and then we went completely 64-bit, uh, and um, wow, you know, compared to where I started the talk, you know, originally we were living inside of a very restrictive 4-gig address space, and, and you know, 64-bit addresses are, address space is basically infinite. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, what a wonderful change uh, for capacity and everything. Um, so, um, you know, I kind of count this as two OS upgrades because, uh, you know, we went from FreeBSD 60.3 on x86 to FreeBSD 8.4 on x86 to um, FreeBSD 8.4 on AMD 64. Um, and, uh, you know, very successful in that. And, the, you know, the cadence of OS upgrades is roughly for us every five or six years. And, um, you know, you've noticed, you know, I've always chosen the higher numbers. Right? I chose 6.3, I chose 8.4, and it was basically a trade-off between the support window versus the maturity, and I wanted the maturity. And you know, we've always felt comfortable in doing our own support, even when it's out of support. Um, you know, we get some field friction, how can you possibly support FreeBSD? Um, you know, when, it, uh, when at, your baseline went out of support, you know, what, five years ago, and I'm like, oh, it's okay, right? It's okay, right? 
Um, we, we, we handled that ourselves. We had no problem with it, and we were happy to do it, and we had a great time. Um, <clears throat> the next upgrade, this is heading into the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we went from uh, FreeBSD 8.4 to FreeBSD 11.4. Um, another very successful merge. By the way, um, uh, I hit the Jonah standard three days dark, twice. We go from 8.4 to 11.4. The organization is bigger. There's more bureaucratic. There's an entire organization devoted to optimization. I mean, to, to, to build automation. And um, so, um, you know, I have, I have all kinds of help and all kinds of help as a result. Uh, this upgrade took seven days dark instead of three, right? Thanks to all the help I was getting. Um, <clears throat> so um, once we get to FreeBSD 11.4, we unwind our NUMA hack. We integrated ourselves with the FreeBSD implementation. Again, continuing our strategic objective of unwinding our customizations and trying to use the, um, the operating system as it was intended to be used. And, um, uh, you know, because... Um, you know, one of the benefits here is that, uh, you know, I've never had to worry about the FreeBSD side of our baseline, right? I mean, we, you know, we, we, have, we have thousands of bugs at all, any one time, you know, as any large mature. I mean, this is, um, at this point, we're talking roughly on the order of 66 million lines of code. Vast portions of the open source world have been downloaded and is contributing to our image. Um, and, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, the... We get tremendous value cross leverage from the high quality operating system that the FreeBSD community has always provided us. I have never had to worry about what was going on in FreeBSD because I always chose a mature, a mature version within a major release stream. And um, literally in the, in, in the quarter century, okay, I could represent um, FreeBSD bugs that I can reproduce on my baseline with a Boolean. Okay, the answer was there was either one bug or zero for 25 years, right? Now, th obviously, there's a lot of bugs open, but we have a particular use case, right? And um, that, to me, is it's just mind-boggling. It's just mind-boggling. You guys have done such a good job, such a good job. Um, <clears throat> so, um, once, uh, now, in this world... Um, one of the things that attracted our attention was hardware PMC, okay? And, um, you know, I, I bashed um, Intel and um, whoever else um, has their fingerprints. If somebody's here was responsible for the IPMI, I'm sorry, but, you know, I, you know, one of the reasons I'm still an individual contributor is because I tell the truth. You know, um, I care about truth. I, I, you know, I don't do PowerPoint. Um, you know, obviously, I'm not management material, so I still manage engineers. I still work on technical issues. Um, <clears throat> you know, my kids, right, they watch me growing up. It's like uh, my two oldest kids, they're both in tech, and they, um, they said, I don't really understand what that guy does, but, boy, he works way too hard for the amount of money he brings home. And uh, so they both did economics, and now they're both in tech. And both of them came back to me later and said, Dad, if I had a chance to do it again, I would have studied software. It's like... Anyway, hardware PMC, great, great capabilities innovated by Intel. You know, so uh, take Intel back, off the, back out of the doghouse and, and laud them for what they were able to achieve. We were so attracted to this, we actually hacked the hardware PMC support back into FreeBSD 8.4 so that we could start to work with it. But the problem was we were working with, um, you know, basically uh, 2016 vintage Xeons. And what we learned through that process is it's not just the code in the operating system, it's actually the microcode and the BIOS and what's running in the Xeon itself. And basically, in the FreeBSD 8.4 context with the processors we were using, hardware PMC was useless for us, okay? It just, you know, um, it, it, it's so bad, so sketchy, so much didn't work. But we stepped forward to FreeBSD 11.4, and then we inherited for free. Once again, we get to throw away something we did because now FreeBSD supports it natively. And uh, what do we find? We find that when we come forward to the vintage 2021 Xeon baseline, all this stuff actually works. And it's like, wow, this is so cool. Now we're able to see stuff because with our architecture, um, we have been... Um, 
memory bandwidth hungry from day one. Our performance model, you know, the metrics about like how fast is fast and you know whose tool chain is better, all that kind of stuff is completely irrelevant to our workload because what we care about in this architecture is that first touch, right? It's that first touch, right? You've got like a packet that's come in, it's sitting in memory, it's killed your cache, it's everything, and you have to do everything. So it's like at one point, you know, that one instruction, the first touch on an incoming packet was like 786 clocks. This is old, obsolete numbers, but it just shows um, you know, what do we care about? We care about memory bandwidth. We, we care about the interconnect between the two sockets. We care about what the um, caches are doing. Um, in, uh, with hardware PMC, it's like um, we used to be um, experts, you know, with our, with our cave hat on, um, spelunking. And, um, you know, thanks to this, we became, uh, you know, it's like, walking into a well-lighted room like this. It's like, wow, we can see what's happening. We can optimize down to the instruction level as we have always done. And um, once again, you know, FreeBSD is there uh, supporting us. Um, <clears throat> so um, the very first box that I drew on the board, the FreeBSD 2.5 system with its uh, one gig NICs uh, would do line rate on carefully selected workloads in the context of that technology. Um, line rate as late as FreeBSD 4.4 for us still was one gig ports. Um, now, you know, the systems that we have today, uh, we have one gig, 10 gig, um, we have uh, 25 gig, 40 gig, we have 50 gig, 100 gig, all these products are in the market. Um, our, um, our highest end system today is capable of um, 275 gigs of throughput. It sold at 250 because, um, you know, we always outperform our market specs, and um, uh, that's done with a software data plane, and it's run done running inside of FreeBSD. And um, it, the fact that I'm even standing here, um, that I worked on the same thing for 25 years almost, is, you know, it says a lot about me. Um, but uh, it, from an industry point of view, this is unquestionably one of the great anomalies in the world of tech, right? That you could have one baseline, one product, one software build survive this evolution on top of FreeBSD from start to finish, still be innovating, still be capturing mindshare within our market. You know, we, we ran Cisco out of our market. We, you know, Cisco bought, um, you know, competitors of ours that died one after another, and eventually there was nobody left to buy. And, um, you know, it's down to us and F5, and, um, you know, they have, a, they have a hardware data plane. They've always had it. We've always had a software data plane, and we've always been operating inside of FreeBSD. And um, uh, every person in this room, you know, without naming our customers, every single person in this room has interacted with a Netscaler between you and what you were trying to talk to uncountable number of times, okay? We have fronted massive portions of the internet in the life of our product. We are a tremendous anomaly, and the only reason we've existed to this time is because some really smart dudes back in the late 90s chose FreeBSD. And I've been responsible for making it work, and I'm here as an ambassador from the Netscaler Nation to thank you. I, I would love, I don't know where we are in time, I would love nothing more than questions. Um, and um, I want to thank especially uh, uh, Mr. Mikuzik who uh, mentored me as I was, I was um, teaching our class at Santa Clara. We did, taught that class for, for 10 years. Uh, the textbook that I cre uh, chose when I started that class is um, the Red Book, and uh, we used uh, the successors until um, the class ended. And you know, as a result of that um, uh, great mentoring, I had fun, uh, supported the NetScaler product. We have students of uh, that work, and I also have um, boxes of VHS tapes in my house with brilliant content that no one can see. Yeah. We are. 
Well, um, some of you may remember my appearance here last year. Um, uh, the next upgrade um, that is chosen by the leadership is Linux. Yeah. Um, and I, uh, I, I think I said enough about that last time. <laughs> so, but I mean, there, I'm collecting great reasons to go to FreeBSD 14. Um, I, I don't believe it'll happen. Oh, well, don't, yeah, I mean, uh, um, so um, there's, there's two paths for that. Um, we have, um, uh, we, you know, in some cases we contributed fixes directly from the product. Uh, you know, we've, we, uh, let's see, um, we've had different parents over the years. And by, by, I mean companies, the Netscaler product is a unified product, but you know, we're now on our, our third parent company. Um, you know, guidance over the years has varied in terms of like how open should we be in terms of directly um, communicating with the FreeBSD community. And so you know, part of the reason, uh, what I chose to take advantage of with this course I was teaching is to smuggle fixes back out to the community through my class. Um, so my name does appear you know, in a small number of places in the FreeBSD source control system. And um, the majority of that work was from my students in this class, not from our product. But we did contribute a couple of things that we found. Um, but um, we didn't, um, you guys didn't give us a lot to fix. Like I said, you know, the bugs uh, could be represented by a Boolean, one or zero, at any given time through this whole, whole history. Um, in terms of things that actually we could reproduce in our in-house. Yeah. Um, I'm not at liberty to, dis to answer that question, um, certainly not in this forum. Uh, but I mean, I'm, I'm, one of the things I'm, I do is I, I'm, one of my responsibilities at Netscaler is I'm their open source steward. So I, I'm the interface between our legal team and our engineering team. And we, we have been very active in terms of um, constructing equivalent functionality and I've been supporting them um, getting their, um, uh, their use cases approved and then you know, ensuring that uh, they're feeding into the compliance engine. You know, we, we have an automated uh, GPL tarball generation uh, that works with every build. Um, you know, we track um, our uh, license list, um, you know, with a, a semi-manual form. Um, boy, would we love a, an SBOM tool. Yeah, we, would, we, would, we started looking at this years ago, and now the parent company has, has started an initiative to do an um, automated SBOM generation tool. Uh, we found, um, I, I, you know, I, I, want, I want to bless those people. Uh, this is not a slam on them, but nothing is close to supporting a baseline the size of ours. Nothing even close. And oh, by the way, <laughs> speaking of um, our baseline, so, um, you know, we had a VP um, who, you know, there, there's basically two kind of C-level people. The, you know, the, the kind of C-level people who will sit there and take the money, and that's my preference. And then there's the people who feel they need to do something. Right? And so this guy, his do something, you know, one example was going to Jira, which was great, it was better. And the other example was um, going from perforce to Git. And, um, you know, Git, uh, you know, I mean, Git is an awesome implementation for the open source world, right? It's like, you know, the burdens on the client, there's no centralized coast of resources. Conceptually, structurally, you know, makes perfect sense for that use case. Uh, you know, basically in our environment, first of all, Git isn't anywhere near big enough. It can't handle a baseline of our size. So we have this massive complexity with sub-modules and, you know, there's only about three people in the company who can figure out how to move stuff forward. And um, then, then um, you know, on top of that, the people who run the servers, the source control servers, they're ecstatic, right? They've been, you know, um, you know like, you know, in the boiler of some 19th century coal burner for, you know, with perforce trying to keep the thing up and working, and now it's getting, it's like, oh, wow, our jobs are great, right? And where did that burden go? It went on the developers, right? You know, we used to, you could switch it between branches in like, you know, five minutes, and now it's three hours, 
right? Um, it's just uh, so, you know, I love the sea level people who just sit there and take the money. Don't, you know, just take the money, right? Leave me alone. I'm here to have fun. I'm obviously, I'm making you rich. Just leave me alone, right? <laughs> so, what? Yeah. Well, if, if the reason you're using submodules is because you overflowed the capacity and there's no hope you'll ever get inside. It's like, okay, why are we here? I, no, and, and that's not a slam on Git, right? It's brilliant. And oh, by the way, that, that VP who made that choice and rammed that down our throats despite the technical feedback about it, he enriched everybody's resumes. Right? So what's the best thing? It lubricated everybody who had to leave, right? It lubricated their resumes. I, I, I know Git. Ooh, hey, you know, great, awesome, right? I know Git and Perforce. Awesome, right? Other question? Yeah. Uh, so everything we did, we did in-house. Um, so um, I've, I've had the privilege of working with some brilliant people. Some of them are in this room. Members of our team are in this room. We have some brilliant, brilliant people. Um, there was one woman who worked for me. Um, I said I wasn't going to drop names. There's one woman who worked for me, and uh, she worked for me twice. And this is the kind of person you used to see in the industry back when people were learning Fortran on cards, right? This woman had a doctorate in comparative theology, and, but she is literally the best um, memory management kernel expert I've ever seen. And she and I collaborated on a, the virtual physical. We, when we got to FreeBSD 6.3, we had to do some changes to the memory map, which you know we found to be non-trivial, but um, she did the physical side, I did the virtual side, and we were able to expand the memory map to deal with some capacity issues. Um, again, one of the things that makes our kernel different is um, our kernels, because the memory, the memory file system is linked into the kernel, uh, we, we boot kernels like 700, um, uh, 700 meg or gig, right? They're way, way, way beyond um, the size that's normally supported. The UEFI bootloader won't even boot our kernels. Um, and, um, but you know, this woman worked with me twice, brilliant woman, and uh, she went off to Apple. She was hired by their performance team, and she was there for three months. And to their credit, the Apple kernel group, told, after three months of looking at her, they said, here's the memory management of the kernel. It's yours, right? Awesome, awesome woman. Um, I've worked with some brilliant people, brilliant people who could visualize instructions and clocks. Um, and, um, but we, all that was in-house. We had the time of our lives. This has been so much fun, so much fun. But our, our relationship to the community has been indirect. And, um, and that's why uh, coming here to express my gratitude to the FreeBSD community is so important to me because you guys have done so much for us and you've, your work has been so excellent and so reliable. And, and, um, and, and, you know, the code itself, right? I mean, how could we have maintained it if it was not clear? One of the things I did, I'll, I'll take credit from my um, management experience, I believe I invented the acronym ODP, right? Object Disoriented Programming. Um, so, and uh, you, you guys are awesome. Any other questions? Thank you so much. I am so happy. I am so happy. <laughs>